Hello, hello, and welcome again to another edition of a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a program that deals strictly with what's going on in the news, Beatle-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, host of the Beatles syndicated radio program, Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by... The Steve Beatles, Arnucci, Beatles Examiner columnist at Examiner dot com. <laughs> you won't even let me uh, announce you at all. Oh, okay. I just I, I thought you were leaving me room there. That's okay. Okay, that <laughs> sounded fine to me. Anyway, on today's show, we're going to be talking about what just leaked out newswise a few days ago, a few days before we're actually doing this show, and that is that Paul McCartney has added four more dates for his on the run tour, and they're all North American dates. So I thought we'd talk about that, and before we do, why don't we just mention the four dates here that I have. One is um, November 11th, that's the first date, and that is at Scott Trade Center in St. Louis. That is his first show in that city in 10 years Mm -hmm. since uh, the 2002 Back in the U.S. tour. Mm -hmm. November 14th will be at Minute Maid Park in Houston, that's his first show there in nearly seven years. And after that, on November 25th, very interesting, he's playing BC Place in Vancouver. The first time in that city since the Beatles played the Empire Stadium there in 1964, almost 50 years ago. And the last date is November 28th at Rexall Place in Edmonton. And that's the very first concert in that city for Paul. So Paul doing four new shows. And as I said, this is uh, a continuation of his On the Run tour. And so I thought we'd talk about that, and I thought one thing we should bring up is the fact that for a few years now, this has been the way that Paul has toured. It's not the old days when you would announce a full tour, and you would have all the dates in front of you, and you would have 30 shows or 50 shows, and you know exactly where he's going to play. You never know Mm -hmm. where Paul's going to be playing next. It's always a scattered uh, bunch of dates that you're handed, in this case, four dates, do you, Steve, like the way that Paul has been doing this the last few years? Well, I think, well, in terms of, of uh, you know, announcing the shows for people like me that are trying to write about him, it's, it's kind of crazy because you never know what is going to happen, and, and fans don't know either. And I've, often, I've heard from many fans who never know, you know, whether to buy for certain shows because you know they don't know what's coming up, hmm. and you know that can be that can get to be an expensive proposition with air f- travel and and things like that. Um, so I don't particularly I don't particularly like the, the way he's been doing this. Um, I you know I understand that he's not doing too many shows. He's basically you know picking and choosing his spots. That's fine, but for the fans who want to get to a show, you know, to be able to get to a show and afford to get to a show makes it very difficult, especially if he ends up doing a show, say, in the Midwest that isn't close to them, and they end up, you know, booking uh, airfare and a hotel and everything for a show, and then they find out that there's going to be a show in their city a couple weeks later that, Mm. they, you know, they didn't have to travel for. It's very frustrating in that regard. Yeah, I, I think it is, and... um you know, it's hard to suggest that he does it, you know, for, you know, whatever reason. I mean, I, th- I think they just kind of book things and, on the fly, you know, as, it, you know, as the tour is named for. But um, it just, I think that's, that's probably one thing that a, a lot of people would love to see stop. Um, you don't think reason. there's a lot of thought being put into the locations of where he's playing? I mean, as I just mentioned, he's playing St. Louis first time in 10 years. Right. And playing well, he, Vancouver uh, since the Beatles. Yeah, I believe he, he basically plays, he try, he's been sticking pretty close to cities that he hasn't played in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's a good thing. It, yeah, it is a good thing. So, I mean, I'm, I'm always getting comments about people saying, well, is he going to come back to New York? Is he going to come back to Los Angeles? Is he going to, you know, is he going to come back to... You know, uh, you know, such and such city, and I think the answer to that is, if he's played the city within the past year, probably not. If he hasn't played the city in more than a, you know in a couple of years, then there's a good chance that he might. There's a chance he might. But that, again, uh, you know, this whole thing about and and about booking shows on the fly um, 
he was really kind of uh, tough for fans and and um you know and then there's all the places that he, he hasn't played people have, in Australia have been screaming for concerts for years right and he hasn't played there and um you know i mean that's just one example cuz i know i i hear about i hear about them uh about from uh people down there all the time and so you know i i i don't know if if he just doesn't want to play there anymore um you know because of the the travel time and the you know and all that uh, you know it's hard to say uh, somebody should ask him <laughs> somebody should ask him and if we <laughs> And, you know, if he ever does a, pre- a press conference, maybe we'll get to do that. But he hasn't done very many uh, as far as, you know, talking about his about his tour. Um, but well, uh, I, I kind of agree with everything that you just said and how, how it is it is very frustrating for many of the fans. But I also know from my perspective, I've lived in the New York area my whole life. And you know that if Paul's going to tour the U.S., he's going to play New York. He's going to play the big cities. He's going to play L.A. You know, there are certain certain cities that he probably has to do. And the mere fact, maybe this is stretching things a bit, but he does have family in New York. So that also might contribute to the fact that he plays there often. It's the biggest city in America, so you know he's going to play there. But the other cities, you know, it, it's a struggle for people to know where he's going to play. Right. I think in terms of publicity, it's brilliant that he does things this way because it keeps his name active out there. Every time he announces dates, his name is in the news. Yeah, and it keeps and it keeps you know and, and it keeps those of us that are trying to keep a track of this stuff. Yeah, you know, busy. Believe me, it really does. And um, you know, there's there's occasionally there's there's um, you know little rumors, but nothing. Even the rumors aren't always you know are accurate. We were you know there were rumors. In fact, when this first group of shows was announced. They only announced one show, and at the time, I'm trying to remember now. Uh, I believe it was the um, St. Louis St. show. St. Louis show that was announced first, and as it turned out, a promoter had already announced the Houston show um, online, even though they didn't. And then what happened was after that, uh, and the other two were or the the, um, the Vancouver the Canadian shows were rumored, and then they were announced the same day. Uh, right. Which was kind of which was kind of unusual because he usually announces them all at once per day, but they made actually two announcements in one day, which was kind of interesting. Hmm. But another thing to bring up here, as far as Paul Paul touring and his schedule is concerned, he said this several times: is that he does kind of schedule himself around his daughter Beatrice, right? Because he wants to spend time with her, and sure. so he tries to find time that he can fit in. And he also happens to like it this way because it makes him hungry to go out and do these shows. If you're doing it every single day for six months in a row, you might not look forward to every single show. But if you have it less, you know, it's, it's a bit more special. That's an interesting, that's an interesting thought, um, you know, from a band perspective. Because, and you gotta, and you got to hand it to him for the success that, that, that the band has had. I mean, they've done, they're, they're, just, they're a knockout. They're fantastic. Hmm. Um, you know, they're, um, I mean, there's, uh, you know, when they originally started, I really didn't put much, you know, I didn't really have that much uh, enthusiasm about what he had gotten. I figured he'd gotten, you know, four young guys that, um, that, you know, he was going to use. I mean, he had, he had dropped a relatively good sounding band um you know and and then picked up these new guys and it was like you know why and i mean with the exception of uh, uh Wicks. Wickens. yeah and um but as it turned out you know you got uh all of them were veterans especially Brian Ray and and Rusty Anderson and uh Abe is a you know is just a fantastic drummer and he also you know does the harmonies um for some of the songs uh, the high harmonies and it's it's fantastic. Um, it's done, a good band, done. although I will say that I, I've enjoyed every single band he's toured with. And from the perspective of the Wings days, the interesting part about when he toured with Wings, and even the, the 89, 90, and 93 tours, those are the bands he had on his albums. Mm-hmm. You know, what he has been touring with since, well, for 10 years now, is basically a touring band, and once in a while they're on his albums. Right. You know, they really haven't done that much with Paul on his albums, whereas if you follow Wings, 
the band that was on Wings at the Speed of Sound is the band that toured in 75 and 76. And, and, right. And, you know, Venus and Mars as well. So, you know, that's the way it was done all those years. This is, I think of them more as a touring band. Although you never know, Paul's next album, he may use them. <laughs> and I suspect, I mean, he's used them, you know, in, um, you know, various projects. He used them on the, um, the, um, the Buddy Holly track last year. So, and, um, Although you know it'd be interesting because of you know the direction he's going with the with the um, with the new album reportedly with with um, you know with Mark the, Ronson with yeah with him and so uh, that'll be interesting to see what what he does in terms of the band. Uh, well, I just think he's very comfortable with these guys, and right. he's been doing this for so long. He doesn't have to work them too hard. You know, they've been doing some of the same songs. And for me, the joy in seeing him from tour to tour is what new songs he adds to the list, whether they're songs he's never done live before or songs that he hasn't done for a very long time. Those are the real highlights for me whenever I see him live. Right. Keep and in mind, you know, like I said, being from New York, I'm very spoiled because he's played here quite a lot. So I've seen a lot of his shows. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot for them to learn four or five new songs for the next leg of the tour. And the experience of the you know the experience of the band is not just as a um, you know as a kind of a Beatle band. Although you know from some quarters I know one music critic called Paul's band the uh, best Beatle um, tribute band there is. Uh -huh. But in 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 honesty, the experience level. I mean, Rusty Rusty, for example, is not, is you know his experience. Um, um, if you look into his background, into the bands he's played with before, it's more es a little more esoteric than, for example, Brian. Although Brian's, you know, Brian's a, a good example too, because I mean, he's, um, you know, he's been, he's done all sorts. Uh, he's done, he's had experience in in different areas. They all have, they're they're very experienced in different areas, and they've done a lot of session work, right? And when you've done session work and you've worked with an eclectic array of musicians it's very impressive and it shows mm -hmm. that you have a wide range and you can handle anything right and when and, you think and, eclectic, I mean, yeah. a, a good example with brian is uh you know his work with edda james right um and that you know i mean that's really kind of interesting um and abe has worked with sting mm -hmm. you know I, I would have to imagine someone like sting is very demanding you know he's not going to work with just anybody mm -hmm. so uh Give a lot of credit to these musicians because they've they've uh, they've lasted all these years with Paul, and Paul still likes him. And he and did, so, a, you know, he did he really did his homework as far as you know who he was picking, and um, and it's worked. I mean, uh, they're they're a great sounding band. There's no question about it. Hmm. Now, the, now the the you know the big question is, are these going to be the only four dates? And my feeling is um, no. I'm thinking there will probably be, um, given the widespread between the, the dates, there will be there will be at least you know a couple of others. That's my that's a guess. There's been no indication so far that that is the case, but I can't see them spreading those dates that far apart. I could always see Paul playing New York in December, <laughs> playing the Garden or a place like that. Well, I'll so. tell you, I, when I saw, it, it was funny that you mentioned that because. When I saw Paul at the Hollywood Bowl, it was in it was at the end of March, and I was expecting, you know, because I'm I don't live in that area, I was expecting it to be relatively warm, and it sure wasn't that night. It was cold. Uh, hmm. <laughs> it was very cold because um, I remember just wearing a light jacket, and I remember I was shivering by the time we got out of there. Right. But uh, I can, uh, but uh, we'll see what happens, and it was also cold. It was also cold when he played uh, at and Park in San Francisco, but, of course, you expect that in San Francisco. You don't expect warm weather there, and it wasn't. And he even, he even said so, and, um, you know, that night. But well, another thing that I think we should bring up, and it's not that pleasant a topic, is the age factor here. I mean, Paul is now 70 years old, mm -hmm. and I think that it's amazing that he does a two-and-a-half-hour show, sometimes longer than that, which would be grueling for anybody at any age. And, and and you know the and one of the reasons for the spread, you know, between the shows, is to give him rest. 
Uh-huh. Um, because, you know, a grueling night after night, even, I mean, even Ringo with the All-Star Band, you know, did, you know, maybe two, maybe three nights. I'm not looking at the, the schedule he just completed, but, I mean, there were a lot of breaks in that All-Star Band tour for good reason, you know. Mm. And, you know, Paul takes, Paul takes breaks, too. And But I, I do believe, you know, over the course of the month, um, doing four shows is a little less than what's going to happen. I'm thinking, and and of course he will probably do the holiday shows in the UK. So um, that's a know, thought. He, yeah. Well, he's he's done that traditionally now for two, at least two years. So there's no, you know, there's no question. You know, I mean, I would think that would be very likely that he'll do that again. So, uh, well, I just think that he's going to keep operating this way. And I think that it's very smart in a way because you were just talking, we were just talking about how difficult this is on the body. But at the same time, if you stay away from it too long, you're going to get rusty. You mm-hmm. know, or, you know, you got to keep your chops in shape. So you got to still do it sporadically so that your body can handle it and your voice can handle it. And he, um, you know, he got a lot of. There was a lot of comments. There were a lot of comments about the Olympic show and the Queen's Jubilee show that they weren't really that good. Hmm. Um, the Queen's Jubilee show was was kind of well. They both were kind of unusual in that they were they were shorter than normal. Um, they weren't full shows, and um, you know, so he basically was kind of you know, it was like he was fit into the show. If you know what I mean? Right. Um, so he wasn't able to do his full show, um, but this way, of course, with these shows, he will be able to. And you know, of course, the big surpri- the big surprise will be what new song he drags out, um, if any. Um, and he probably will. He'll probably bring out a new song. I was I was talking the other day about this because you know you saw the Africa Express mm-hmm. performance and Paul brought out "Good Night Tonight." Mm-hmm. which he hasn't done since the 1979 UK tour. And, uh, you know, I love that song, and I wish he'd bring it back over here. That would be that would be interesting. I'm not sure that would work so well on stage with that band, but who knows? We'll see. I mean, anything... I, I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head there. I'm just kind of, you know... Um, that kind of... I mean, was the, the group he was playing in that ensemble group, um, you know... It was very rhythmic was very rhythmic and that was per, you know that was a good fit for that particular song. It makes you wonder though if he has that in the back of his mind. To oh bring yeah. That out I, now, so. Sure. Yeah, that'll be it'll be interesting to see if he if he pulls that one out. You know, he's got a catalog that is so massive. He can draw on just about anything, but I also know that Paul really knows how to work a crowd. He knows what songs have worked especially if you're doing a stadium show. He knows there are a lot of young people who basically know him so much more for his Beatles stuff than for his solo music. So he's going to play quite a lot of Beatles music, which is my only real criticism of seeing him. On the one hand, I'm so happy that he's doing anything because he doesn't have to tour, he doesn't have to do anything. But I just wish that he'd show a little bit more pride in his solo catalog. But then, you know, if you're you're packing stadium shows of 50,000, 60,000 people... They're going to want to hear the songs that they know, and the songs mm-hmm. that they do know are the Beatles songs. And there's no way that he can do a show without doing those classics, without doing "Hey Jude" and "Yesterday" and "Let It Be" and those songs. And he do, and they do a great job with them. I mean, they do a fantastic job with them. Like I said, you know, uh, the the one critic who called them the best Beatles tribute band of all time. I mean, he does. There's nothing uh, shortchanged about what he does there's no imitation sound they sound great no you you definitely get your money's worth no matter what he gives mm-hmm. you his all there's, there's no complaint there for how much he gives you i just wish as someone who's studied his whole catalog and grown up with him year after year with every new release that it would be a little bit more balanced between his solo material and the Beatles stuff you know there's so much great stuff that he's done in his solo career that he's never done live before or songs that he hasn't done since the 76 tour, 75, 76. I was so happy when he brought back Venus and Mars Rock Show, Mm -hmm. although an edited version of the song, or Letting Go. I like like that, too. You know, Uh, Letting Go is a great live song. It's better as a live song than than a studio recording. The one one that really caught me was Mrs. Vanderbilt. I thought that was just... 
That yeah. was genius. That was pure genius to do that. And that um, works. Certain songs just happen to work as a live song. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and, the, and the story about that one is very funny because it was voted on in in uh, in Europe. You know, that was voted on by fans, and the fans were the ones that brought that gave him the idea to use that. And that did, was that was in this that was in Russia, right? Well, yeah, I believe it was. Yeah, there was a Russian fan club that voted for that, and he did it for that reason. Mm-hmm. And not only has he kept doing it, but he really enjoys doing it. <laughs> yeah, and it were and it, it's it's a great song. It's fantastic, fantastic live song. I mean, uh, you know, they do a they do a great job with it. So, well, that Russian fan club also just recently did a poll, and they wanted Monk Bray Moon Delight to be a song that he would add to his set list. And he hasn't done that one. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> that's that's a little more difficult. That's a little more difficult. But who knows? Maybe he'll try it. You never, you never can tell. But, uh, you know, all in all, I'm just very pleased, like I said, that he's doing anything at this point because he doesn't owe us anything. And I think he wouldn't be doing this unless he genuinely enjoyed it. Same thing with Ringo. I really think when I see Ringo on stage, I think he's having the time of his life, you know. So, right. I think it's the same thing with Paul. And the mere fact that, like I said, he's not doing too much of it, but when he does it, he's really into it. I think you could tell, especially when become, the band is jamming together. You know, he's really having a blast. And they've become events. I mean, not just because, you know, I mean, people really, I mean, there's, there's no, you know, he's playing the big halls, the big venues. Mm. Um, I mean, let's not talk about the prices, but, I mean, he's, you know, he's playing the big halls. The shows are are selling out. I mean, it's it's incredible. He's, the demand is is there. He knows it. They know it. You know, it's just it's amazing. And also, you know, I was mentioning before the age thing. You know that with just about every single artist that's out there that's a veteran in that age bracket, the number of concerts are less, and they're going to be less for that reason. And, mm-hmm. and so each concert becomes more special, unless you're Bob Dylan. And you tour every single year. Yeah, I, you know. I don't. I don't understand that boy. He's you know, he's amazing. I there mean. are a few exceptions to the rule there, but it's only natural that you know the age factor. You're going to slow down, right. so the concerts are less. They become more special. There's always that factor of will he ever do this again? Every time you see him, so that makes you want to see him even more. Right. And when you see what a great show it is. And you know that this guy is 70 years old, and he's up there for two and a half hours, which I think is extraordinary. And, uh, you know, I've said this before on various programs, but if you go back to his whole history, with the exception of when the Beatles played in Hamburg, the Beatles did half-hour shows. And then when, when Paul started with Wings, the shows were very short. They were really only an hour in the very beginning. And then when you moved into the, the Wings Over the World tour, then you started getting the two-and-a-half-hour shows. But even then... You had Denny Lane singing lead on a handful of songs. Right. You had Jimmy McCulloch doing Medicine Jar. It wasn't Paul doing the lead on every song. Nowadays, Paul does everything. You know, even in the 89, 90, and 93 tours, you still had Robbie McIntosh do an instrumental or something. You know, or the, the band would break out and do Pick Up the Pieces for Hamish Stewart. Now every song is a Paul song, and it's a Paul lead vocal. And it's really demanding for two and a half hours to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's extraordinary to see this guy get up there on stage. I would not be at all, I I would not feel shortchanged if as the years go on, he shortens his shows. But I think that Paul is so used to giving people two and a half hours that if he ever had to give them less, he might not want to do it anymore. He wants to give people their money's worth. Right. And you can really tell. I mean, you leave every show thinking, whew, <laughs> he yeah. did all that, you know, and when you think the show is over, there's another encore, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, it's an amazing experience. And for me, whenever I see Paul or Ringo live, the, one of the big joys for me is seeing people who, have seen, who are seeing him for the first time, who can't believe what they're seeing, and that someone his age, I hate to keep saying that, but can, can do this for so long it really is an amazing thing to watch in front of you right yeah it really it really is something he's he's uh you know i mean that's as much as as much as you can sit in the audience and and enjoy it you know there's a lot of work there's a lot of work there and uh 
you know, I can only imagine what goes on behind the scenes to uh, to get him together for that thing. I mean, that's just incredible. Hmm. Well, like I said, I just think that he really does enjoy this. Yep. And that's that's a big factor right there. And he enjoys the musicians. And he yep. has he has a lot of fun. And that's right. really important at this stage in his career. He, he only wants to do what he wants to do. Right. And that's what he should be doing. Making music, making new albums, and touring. So mm-hmm. I'm yes, just grateful. Absolutely. I'm grateful that he's doing anything. Although yep. I, I and just we'll, and we'll and we'll even have a new album by him uh, in the near future sometime. Yeah. And so. I can't wait for that. Yep. So. so that wraps up our conversation about Paul and the four new dates on his On the Run tour. I'm Ken Michaels, and if you want to find out more about me and my radio program, Every Little Thing, all you have to do is go to my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. You'll find lots of information about me, the show. There's trivia on there. There's interviews, all kinds of things. And Steve, for people to find out about you. If you want to find out about me, go to examiner.com and look up my last name, Mirhas. Look up my name, Steve Marinucci, and you'll find my, my Beatles Examiner page. Actually, you'll find probably all my pages, but I do a total of, of four Beatles columns, the Beatles Examiner column and columns on uh, George Harrison, Paul McCartney, and Ringo Starr, plus a TV column and a vintage rock and roll column. You're constantly writing. I'm constantly writing. You're right in front of that computer all day long. I am, just about. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much, Steve, and uh, we'll see you again real soon. This okay, is- and for uh, if you want to hear this show again, go to beatlesexaminer.podbeam.com, and you'll, you'll see the show's archived. That's right. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.